Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. We are coming to you from the spacious Carol Shields Auditorium in the wonderful Millennium Library, which is located on Treaty 1 territory and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. On today's slate, Walk Away by Cory Doctorow. I'm Alan Chorney, known in library circles as the branch head librarian of Transcona Library, and across the table from me is... Hi, uh, my default name is Trevor, but uh, now I'm TRVR, the disembodied AI that runs the Lou Riel Library. <laughs> oh my goodness. I didn't know we were doing the fun I didn't like know we that. were going to do that either. <laughs> my name's Kirsten, and I'm the branch head at Harvey Smith Library. And across the table from me is... I'm Erica, I'm the branch head at Fort Gary Library. A good book can carry me away from an And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. It's your questions and comments that form the heart of our discussions. So make us laugh or make us cry by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or leave a comment on our website, wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Find out if your comment made it on the air by subscribing to Time to Read on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. In a moment, Kirsten will start us off by giving us a brief bio of Cory Doctorow, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. Then on to the discussion, which you can get in on by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Don't forget to stick around to the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. And if you haven't read Walk Away, this is your last chance to press pause. Don't worry. We'll wait. Kirsten, over to you. Thanks. I like how you always say, and Kirsten will give us a brief bio because I feel like I could go on and on and on when I'm doing these bios of these authors because they're all so fascinating. Cory Doctorow. Doctorow is an author, activist, journalist, and blogger. Born 1971 in Toronto, he is the son of a father born in a refugee camp in Azerbaijan. He has lived in London, where he became a British citizen by naturalization in 2011, but he currently lives in Los Angeles. Dr. O began selling fiction at 17 years of age and has written adult and young adult novels, nonfiction business books. He is a professor of computer science. He works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a leading nonprofit defending digital privacy, free speech, and innovation. And he's also co editor and co founder of the Boing Boing website, which is a site focusing on themes including technology, futurism, intellectual property, science fiction, etc., etc., etc. Known almost as much uh, as an internet activist, um, as, a, as a novelist, he is a really strong supporter of open copyright and creative commons, which allows for the free sharing of digital media. And in fact, he publishes most, if not all, most. I think, of his own work under the Creative Commons license. He is the originator of Dr. O's Law, which is, quote, anytime someone puts a lock on something you own against your wishes and doesn't give you the key, they're not doing it for your benefit. He is not related to E.L. Dr. O. <laughs> you, you forgot the most important part of his life. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> He met me on the street. Of oh my <laughs> goodness! A few years ago, I, I think he also had a selfie with Trevor at the yeah. CLA conference That's in true. Winnipeg. Yeah, in true. Vancouver, I think Cory Doctorow <laughs> ran up to Alan. It's like, are you Alan Doctorow? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, That's exactly how that went. <laughs> Better known as the branch head at Transcona <laughs> Public Library. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, and then like for me, when I met him at the library conference, he was just really great because afterwards he was chatting and being super available to people. And I was supposed to, I wanted to bring a copy of one of his books to get signed, and it was just one of those crazy mornings. I I forgot to bring it so i was just like i feel like such a big idiot i don't have the i don't have the book and uh, so he took my email address and then he emailed me a copy of the book and i thought i was such a special snowflake <laughs> until i realized that all of his books are like online but still he emailed me and he said pleasure to meet nice. you or lovely to meet you that's and amazing me actually a, so now i still have the uh, like the pdf file of his book oh. that it's just like a little special thing so that's all i'm gonna say about that <laughs> that's amazing that's really good so your so your summary for walk away this is adapted from the blurb for the book, as well as I'm going to quote some of the quotes from the back of the book that I especially enjoyed. So in a world where a fraction of the 1% hold indescribable power, 
Hubert and his friends just walk away. They are trying to create something new and better, built on ideals of abundance, not scarcity, and equality. It's a lofty goal, yet their main opposition is not reality, it's the retaliation of the society they left behind. Then the walkaways discover the one thing the ultra-rich have never been able to buy, cheating death. Now it's all-out war, but how do you fight an old enemy without giving back into the old ways? And on the back of the book, there's two great quotes. One from Edward Snowden. A dystopian future is in no way inevitable. Walkaway reminds us that the world we choose to build is the one we'll inhabit. Technology empowers both the powerful and the powerless. And if we want a world with more liberty and less control, we're going to have to fight for it. And the other one's from Neil Stevenson. And just bear with me. The Bhagavad Gita of Hacker, Modern, Burner, Open Source, Git, New, Wiki, 99%, Adjunct Faculty, Anonymous, Shareware, Thingiverse, Cyberpunk, Cypherpunk, LGTBQIA, Asterix, Squatter, Upcycling Culture, zipped down into a pretty damned tight techno thriller with a lot of sex in it. I like that. that those are both great quotes by Famous great people. people. Yes. <laughs> So I thought we would start with, I think, the most important question that we asked on social media, which was the first question that we asked on social media, which was in the book, Walk Away. Folks who've had enough with the default society simply walk away from it with the desire for a better life, for a utopia. Does the idea of walking away resonate with you? What would push you to walk away from the default society in which we find ourselves? And I think we should bring in one of our listeners, uh, one of our readers who responded to us on our website, just like you can at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. And Amy wrote in and she said, Walking away certainly crosses my mind, specifically in the summer, being able to spend time with my family, pets, and friends outdoors grow my own food and have time to connect with those around me instead of schlepping off to a job sounds glorious until I remember what winter is like in Winnipeg. I hope those 3D printers can make some warm furnaces and winter vegetables. Increasing daycare costs would push me over the edge to walk away from our current society. Refer back to my first point of wanting to spend more time with my own family instead of having them spend their days with other people because I have to work and hand over my check directly to my daycare mm -hmm. provider. This also ties in to a line from the novel that stuck with me. Our identities exist in combination with other people. Do I like the person I am with when I'm at work all day? Yes, but I prefer the one that I am after hours, surrounded those by those of my choosing. Fantastic mm. answer. Yeah. And really good quote, too, to pull yeah. from yeah, the thanks. book as well. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, that's great, Amy. So, walking away. Would you guys walk away? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I would be too chicken to walk away. <laughs> I, I think I would probably ingratiate myself with a Zoda or a Zada, <laughs> but just like uh, Natty the Merc. You know, I would just try to like find a super rich uh, Zoda and try to like find how could I just like cling to this person's coattails <laughs> and l live a de decent living. But like, yeah, I'd be too, I would be a like what? sugar daddy yeah, Zoda. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd be like, yeah, what do you need? You know, I can be a cook maybe. <laughs> I'll, you know, I'll scramble some eggs, like whatever it is. You know, that's that would be me. I think. But you guys would walk away, hey? I would totally walk away, especially the way things are now. I would just give up on it. I think really what would make me do it is if my family would do it. Like if the people that I care about were all in the same place, just leave right. all together. Totally. But then, it, you know, in my family history, I have relatives who did that, you know, in from Ukraine. And they said, everybody's got to leave. So they said, okay, the whole town just up, right. came to Manitoba. Wow. So that's what I would do. Right. It doesn't yeah, this isn't a new concept yeah. of, of walking away, right? No, I'll just go start a farm somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember my my mom always having this this um, this memory of being like in a the gas station, getting gas for the car, and her four kids were in the car. It was in Whitehorse, and I guess maybe Dad was filling up the gas with the car, and she looked out into this field, and she's like, "I could just start walking away. Yeah. I could just start walking, maybe running away, yeah. and just be gone." But I feel like I actually am already walking away. Doing just in little bits and spurts. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm so not exactly in the same way that the book handles it, but. You're like those communities where, where they're just living right on the fringe, where they kind of still have one foot in default and one foot in the uh, walkaway world. That's one, right. One Whoa. day you'll, you'll take the plunge the, and, and yeah. put your head underwater. Yeah. I, I feel like I wouldn't walk away and I don't know that it's because I would be afraid to, I think. Maybe I've read too much Steven Pinker, but I think we live in a, a society that's the best society that we've 
ever had. So to walk away from that comes with a huge risk to dismantle the society. And tra- instead, not to say that the society is perfect, but I think it's a more noble goal to work towards incrementally bettering our society as opposed to walking away from it. But kind of what I like about the idea is that because it is such a critique of capitalism and the the society that we're living in now that instead of having like a revolution, well, I mean, it is a revolution, but it's like it seems like sort of a gentler one. I know it's not because, okay, I didn't read the book. (laughs) I guess this is time to get just put it out there to to, to just get get, come clean with this. But um, so as I sort of interject with my own opinions. Can you tell us why you didn't read the book? I'm I, super curious to know. I didn't read the book. I did start it. I actually really love the idea of what the book is about. And um, I feel like I agree with lots of the stuff that I've read about the book. But I think I've said before that reading about utopias and dystopias and and the future fu- and science fiction isn't really my favorite genre. So I feel like I've already read quite a bit and I was mm-hmm. away on holidays this month and I'm like, eh, I'm not going to actually read it. <laughs> so sorry. Also, I just want it to be a good role model for people that if you do start a book and you don't like it, you do not have to finish yeah. it, but you can still contribute to conversations. <laughs> you can still listen to this podcast. Still go to your book club. And still go to the book club. Yeah. And you'll, you know, I may well pick this book up because when I did start to read it, I, I felt like like he's a good writer and he's quite accessible. Um, I just felt I, once I got into some of the jargon stuff, I just it yeah. just kind of turned me off a little bit. So sometimes it's just not what you feel like. And, That's right. And a yeah. few months from now, you'll be like, you know what I feel like? <laughs> something I, kind of computery and <laughs> jargony. I, and, yeah, I feel like something That's, about yeah. yeah. So to put it in in a nutshell, it's okay to walk away from walk away. <laughs> Whoa! Oh my it's okay goodness! To walk away from pretty much anything. <laughs> That's right. If it's not working for you, just. Just, just walk away. Yeah. That, that yeah. reminds me of like Stephen King's rule of thumb uh, for reading books, where he always says you should use the ten percent rule. So if a book is five hundred pages long, just read the first fifty pages, and if the thing hasn't grabbed you by then, just put it down. Like don't feel bad about it. Just go read something else. Life's too short to stick with a book. So I always keep that in the back of my head. I yeah. was look, look see how long a book is. I'm like okay, I made it past ten percent, and yeah. I'm still into it. So I guess I'll carry on. So that's a little bit of helpful kind of advice I read once, and I, I use that now. Yeah, don't I, feel bad about it. I remember the first book I walked away from I remember because I used to read books all the way through I felt like a failure as a teenager if I didn't read the book all the way through (laughs) oh dear Uh, so that's how nerdy of a teenager (laughs) I was but I was reading a collection of the year's best science fiction and fantasy 1994 let's say I don't remember the exact year but it was just so boring I was like this can't be the year's best science fiction (laughs) and fantasy it was a a low year for science fiction it was a low year and I, I yeah I gave it up and I felt so guilty afterwards. I've long since left that guilt behind. Good. Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. I don't, I, you hear it so much, especially working at a library where you're, you're like, oh, you know, can, do you want a recommendation? And somebody will say something like, oh, there's a book I'm trying to get through right now. And yeah. I say, you know what? Put it down. I don't follow any rule. If a book doesn't grab me right away, if it's not what I feel like reading, I put it down. If I lose steam halfway through, I put it down. Maybe I'll come back to it. But maybe just where my brain is at has changed or what I'm interested in has changed or another book has come to my attention that I really want to read right now. You get so much more out of a book if you read it when you want to read it instead of when you've started it or it comes across and you have to to read it. If, If the reading isn't fun, don't do it. Yeah. Like reading should be fun. I but, think the experience of reading, like where you're reading the book can have a, an effect too. Like for me, I read a big chunk of Walk Away in a hammock <laughs> next to uh, Clear Lake. And then I read another big chunk uh, after like long hikes in the mountains this summer. So like both situations, I super relaxed. I loved perfect. it. And so I think I enjoyed it more than if I was reading it in another kind of situation. It just was the perfect thing for me to get into and get through. It's almost yeah. like watching a, a movie at the recliner theater where like the movie <laughs> might, not, might not be that great. I think Linda Holmes talks about that on culture happy hour but you know if, the, if you're in a recliner you can sit through just about anything so <laughs> yeah yeah make it pleasant hey everyone do you like reading of course you do you're listening to a podcast called time to read unless you downloaded us by mistake and we're really looking for time to weave a niche podcast about looms if that's the case then why are you still listening get weaving anyway for the rest of you you may be interested to know that the winnipeg international writers festival or WIF, is happening September 21 to 29. There will be a bunch of events happening in the Carol Shields Auditorium Millennium Library over the lunch hour that week, as well as programs beginning at 4.30 p.m. each day. 
The motto of the festival is, where readers meet writers. But you could also say, where writers meet readers, couldn't you? I guess if you were extra friendly, you could call it where readers meet readers, but that could happen anywhere. Anyway, for the complete listings of library programs, please check out the latest edition of our At the Library newsletter. And for more information on the festival, please visit their website at thinairwinnipeg.ca. WIF, where writers and readers meet other writers and some other readers, maybe. So we're back to the question yes, that's yeah. right, that's that right. I sort of tried to jump in, even though I hadn't actually like read the yeah. book. So did we decide that pretty much if other people were maybe walking away with us, we might be a bit braver to do so? Some of us would do that. <laughs> some, some of us would stay, <laughs> stay in society yeah. as it okay. is. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, I, I, the quote that Amy pulled out, I thought mm. I uh, resonated with me when I read it in the book as well, which is that our identities exist in combination with other people, which I think is a really interesting thing to think about in in navigating society. So I don't know if I have any deeper thoughts than that yeah. about the <laughs> quote, uh, but, you know, it makes you want to surround yourself with people who will make you better or, you know, who have your best interests in mind or who, you know, you can collaborate with and work with to do things and to make yourself and to make society better, which builds on your identity versus yeah. not being around those people. Because that's what I, I liked about the premise of the book is that when we're working together, we can actually make technology into something to create that's a better society. And so so the com combination of people working together and then the technology. Yeah. And you don't always get that when you're talking about technology because sort of the human element, okay, in my mind, um, yeah. that that's often taken away. Yeah, well, and the purpose of technology being to serve people rather than to sell things or manipulate nature unnaturally or all these scary things that we think of. In a book like this, people are taking charge of the technology and saying, well, this is what we want to use it for, um, you know, to the chagrin of the people who want to keep power. But I think that's like, and that's, that's he was talking about like a social, it's a social media type thing, right, where you can't fight a small group. If they have at their disposal contact with a huge group, then suddenly you're fighting a, hu a huge group of coordinated people instead of the small band that you think that you're actually mm -hmm. up against. I was just going to say, I mean, we can debate whether uh, this is a dystopian novel or a utopian novel, but one of the things uh, that kind of weighs in the, in the balance that's utopian is that he kind of believes in sort of the better part of human nature, that if human nature, uh, you know, a group can work together and produce something better than the sum of its parts. But I know like in experience that, you know, in life, sometimes if you like you know, are on a committee or something, the work that comes out is like the lowest common denominator. <laughs> and, and it's just kind of like, ah, oh, this would be so much better. Like you know, this yeah. compromise thing is no one's happy with this. But in the book, like when they're building the B&B &B and uh, Lim Limpopo, I think, is that? Uh, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't look at me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure how, far, how far did you get in the book? Like 20 pages? But, no, but, so like, you know, she, she was, uh, didn't want to take leadership but she was so happy to like not be the actual leader even though she was the de facto leader and was always saying oh this place is so much more better because people go in and rewrite the code and build this and yeah. you know i could not have come up with this on my on my own yeah. you know she says which i think is very hopeful and optimistic yeah. but maybe not super realistic yeah i i, w I would agree with that i mm -hmm. i felt that perhaps and i think this is a thread that runs through a lot of cory talk books is that it's a little bit idealistic which isn't, you know, a problem necessarily in terms of writing a book or having something to strive for. But sometimes the way his characters get through uh, their struggles in society, I don't think is quite, quite realistic. Yeah, they had it. They had there was a great line in there about things working in theory and then not in reality and then things not working in theory and then working in reality. So it's it's going to be where there's like 10 million tiny factors that determine whether or not it works. But I liked your point about whether it was a dystopia or a utopia because it was a utopia that we didn't really get to see. And that's the only thing that really drove me crazy was so much about the about the book was when something bad, especially, well, it would be default doing something bad to what they were trying to build. And I wanted to see more of what how it functioned, what they were mm. doing. And apparently it worked for several years in the middle. And then at the end, it seems like it's probably going to work. So I think it is a utopia. We just get to see the like the battle dystopian part of the struggle before that utopia. But I think his working title was Utopia. 
Oh, there's, oh there you go. interesting. Well, it's a very, yeah, I mean, yeah. What did you think of the ending, Kirsten? <laughs> <laughs> So the, I think another reason why I wouldn't want to walk away or at least walk away in this society is I think that the, I mean, use quotes here, utopia that they created was definitely not a place that I would want to live. Um, what? It, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, either. at the very least, I would like a bedroom, um, <laughs> probably my own living space. But that that's one I of the things. I think that'd be okay. I don't I, think they like forced people to like I, live I'd be communally afraid, yeah. who didn't want no, to. No, not, n- not so much like forced to had a gun to their head but i mean the the kind of idea was that you know you had this communal space and you know mikasa sukasa uh when they first walk away they go swimming and they leave their bags behind and they get stolen and limpopo is like yeah happens it happens yeah it happens in default too no it definitely does happen in default i'd be afraid of getting an std from that onsen (laughs) all those people in there what's going on you know there's a lot lot of steamy (laughs) steamy business going on in that thing you know but in default society if you have something that's stolen from you the reaction isn't the reaction is well i have some structure in this society that i can go to the police or whoever to you know help solve this issue so you're a schlepper I um, <laughs> can we def- about- can we define just for the audience maybe what what's, well, you mean the audience sh- that may not have read the book what's, what's a schlepper <laughs> the schlepper is, is especially when people first walk away from default and they right. have all their stuff yeah. right yeah. on their back and they're schlepping it around mm-hmm. and, and then eventually they realize they don't have to do that because wherever they go people will have what they need and it'll be see that sounds like a beautiful thing I right. totally get behind that you know even though I would not walk away a million years I did like that idea <laughs> like that you're getting stronger <laughs> and stronger and you're conviction about not walking away. I did love that freeing idea that all you need is just yourself. And it's almost like, I mean, I haven't done a lot of this, but the idea of like when you're like on a a hike and all that you need is just in your backpack, you've got your shoes, you know, you'll find food somewhere, you know, and this place with the, we can talk about 3D printing in a bit, but you know, you can fabricate anything you actually need. And just that Mm -hmm. idea that you you don't have to be a schlepper, you know, you just, you can just shed all that stuff because you'll, you can make what you need and you have it and it'll be enough and i was like oh you know maybe maybe i could maybe walk away just for the weekend and then go back to default you know on monday you know when i was saying that i i'm already sort of walking away a little bit and i think you know some of these caminos that i'm doing you know occasionally where i do i'm walking away i do i'm a schlepper still and i and i've heard more people talk about this too just how freeing it is in terms of how little you have to bring with you and you just begin bringing even less and less as you as you do your walks, because you realize you don't need as much as we think we do. And and so you sleep in a dorm on one bed with a bunch of people. And it's not that bad. It's quite great, actually. But would you want to sleep in a room with a bunch of people like for the rest of your life? Like, so it's fine. This? When I walk away, Ellen, yeah. I yeah. will make a place where you can just come and have your own space and do your own thing and people will not bug you. Aww. That 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 is kind of like my ideal walk away. Like if I were to walk away, I you just could, want to be like a hermit in the and woods. And you just need to walk away in the other direction from Alan's everybody cabin. else. Then. Alan's cabin's over there. Don't bug him today. It's Tuesday. He needs to be alone. <laughs> totally He's going to write his novel. <laughs> He's going to write his novel finally. But um, but to the the point of not needing stuff, I really, lo- that's one of the, my, maybe my favorite part was the attitude of changing from the scarcity mentality to the abundance mentality. And I think it resonated with me because as the descendant of recent immigrants and my parents all grew up without a lot of money, they kept everything everything. You keep everything because you might need it or somebody you know might need it. And just the amount of stuff, but also junk, you know, like pieces of wood that are kept in basements for years. (laughs) And you don't, you don't, need to do that anymore because we are living in a time of abundance. And so, you know, things like minimalism and stuff are really worth thinking about because you don't need to keep stuff just in case you need it when you can go out and get it for like a dollar fifty, you know, in the middle of the night if you need it. Yeah. It's a very different way of thinking than a lot of people or people in the past. But to me it's the same kind of thing. And it reminds me of a, a minimalism tip for packing for a trip. If you it's twenty twenty. If you can get it in under twenty minutes for under twenty dollars, don't pack it just in case because mm. there's no point i've that, heard that is so. not uh not even a minimalist tip for traveling but as like a minimalist tip for like your yeah. living space i use that i use that all the time the irony here is is that i do i do like that minimalist mentality of getting rid of things that you don't need as someone who's like recently inherited like two generations worth of stuff and going through it is an unbelievable 
well, it's maybe not unbelievable, but, but it is a burden mm-hmm. that you that you have to do and, and take care of and, and sort through. And a lot of things that have meaning to your parents or grandparents don't necessarily have meaning to you. Like um, the pieces of wood in the basement. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what? They came in handy for last minute school projects. It's mm-hmm. true. <laughs> but I, I don't know if the time saved was worth the right. 30 years of keeping the wood. But yeah. But but then going back to like, I think there is a small sphere of stuff that I do want to keep to myself that I don't want other people to have yeah. access to. I want it to be as small as possible, but I don't. I am a personal space person as well. I don't think that I that I could live exactly as they do. Maybe similar. Maybe next door. I probably couldn't either. I have a very (laughs) romanticized notion of it all. That's why I just do my walkaways and you know portions, manageable chunks. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But you know, it's it's something to strive for, right? Yeah. Like that makes it just because you wouldn't want to live in the walkaway society doesn't make it not fun to read about or not fun to think about or wouldn't work for make incremental changes too. Like you you had mentioned the three D printers and how you know, part of what made it kind of workable was because everything that they made was with Yeah, they could design and, and make whatever they needed. Yeah, yeah. and they would yeah. go out and get like feedstock. So that could just be whatever material, material they needed. Or material. To, <laughs> material with the accent. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I know. loved that scavenging for, or the drones would scavenge for things and then say there's a cache of this over here and they would go and scavenge it and break it down somehow, I guess. Like Star Trek, the replicators. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah exactly. Yeah. Except something that is sort of here now, in a way. Yeah, I've yeah. definitely heard um, stories of 3D printed food out mm. there. I haven't looked mm-hmm. too much into them. That was another question that we asked was about the 3D printing. And if anyone uh, in the novel, were, were there things that were 3D printed that were your, fa- were your favorite? So that was an awkward sentence. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what, were was there, there things that were printed that weren't your favorite? <laughs> yes. I'm talking like TRVR, the <laughs> disembodied <laughs> head. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. So did, did you guys have anything particularly in the novel that was favorite of yours that was printed? I have, I have a thing, but go oh, ahead. Oh, I, I just really liked the idea of printing clothes, yeah. you know, mm. and I just imagined them like, uh, like weatherproofed, like a, a cross between like mountain equipment, you know, the North Face LL Bean, like just super sturdy, you know, it had all the wicking features, you know, you could just, you could just customize it to your size. And I was just like, oh yeah, I would be all over like making like outdoors clothes, you know, yeah. just wearing them. No yeah. seams. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Can, like, we, can we do that yet? Can we 3D print? Potentially, I guess. Clothes? Plastic? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. If I'm, it, try, I'm trying to make contact with our producer to see if he, he's oh, giving us man, the wish. Come see, come he's see. Come printer. see. Yeah. Yeah. Expert. Every, every, if you every, want every, really every. stiff plastic clothes, <laughs> uh, but people do do a lot. If you're into cosplay, I know a lot of cosplayers do a lot of 3D printed accessories, oh, accessories. for like mm. you know if you need a specific uh, plate armor piece for your your cosplay costume, you can print that out. Nice. Well, I was trying to think too about like because I'm just not super creative that way about what I could use a 3D printer for. But I did find an article that said 20 things you'll never have to buy again if you own a 3D printer. How do you find these lists? Oh, I just, you know, I just, it's my thing. So, for example, like, I'll just throw these out here. I mean, apparently, and, you know, Dennis can nod or shake his head whether he's, whether he's seen these or he thinks these are, these are for real or not. Uh, Shower heads, ball openers, planters, outlet protectors, uh, pen holders, desk organizers, drink coasters. Uh, wall mounts for anything, uh, wind- windshield scrapers, it's a good one for wind oh, bag. Break. Uh, measuring cups, citrus juicers, chip clips, you know, those little oh, things to yeah. keep things fresh. You can, uh, yeah. t- uh, uh, this one's kind of dumb, toothpaste tube squeezers. So, I would uh, real necessity. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> candle holders, vases, or vases, <laughs> door stops, earbud holders, zipper pull replacements, uh, drain covers, Oh, and this is a gross term, or hair traps. Oh. Yeah, for mm-hmm. thing. Smartphone and tablet stands and phone cases. So all of is these things, phone, they're yeah. cheaper to I, print I mean, 3D. Yeah. This is always my... I, I, can, I can give you a, a specific uh, example of, of 3D printing and whether or not it's been cheaper or mm-hmm. more expensive. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys have noticed, right in front of us, we have a nice centerpiece on our table. Oh, I was wondering what that yeah. was. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll take a picture and put it in the show notes. But this is a 3D printed stand. Uh, does anyone want to guess what it holds? I thought it was a microphone holder at first, but no, I mean, obviously it's oh. not. It, it looks almost like one of those things that yeah, the shoe stores have where you can measure your foot, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, really it's, tiny. But, but it's really a tiny foot. So I, 
I have no I don't know what that is. Uh, so it is a stand for a virtual reality headset. <laughs> oh <laughs> my goodness. Boy. Uh, so yeah, so I was looking for a long time for a, a PSVR headset mount because it's kind of a clunky, awkward piece of equipment to have just sitting somewhere. So I wanted to stand for it. And it's really hard to find one online. They're all expensive or they look a little bit shoddy. So one day I thought, you know, maybe I'll see if there's any available to 3D print. And lo and behold, I went to Thingverse and there is. So if you're in the market for a VR headset mount, if you go to Thingverse and and look it up, they have a few different options available. Uh, So I printed it out at the Millennium Library in the Idea Mill, just like you can all out there (laughs) in audience land. And I, I hold a record at the at the idea mill now. Oh, mm-hmm. how long did it take? I don't know how long it took, oh, but this oh. is definitely the biggest oh, project okay. that they've ever. It's beautiful. It's really cool. Out. Really cool. Yeah, um, it looks quite sturdy. So yeah, no, it looks sturdy. It. Uh, oh, Kirsten's gonna poke it. Oh, she's lifted it up. It is. Does it look sturdy, sturdy and light? Uh, it cost me, I think, about thirty-three dollars hmm. uh, in materials, which is cheaper than it would have cost me to order one. Uh, mm-hmm. It would have cost me forty dollars plus tax uh, mm. to order one. So plus shipping plus, uh, well, probably would have got it free with shipping. But uh, uh, but yeah, it, it looks great and yeah, it looks uh, yeah. works great and it's cheaper. And that's so I saved I saved a bit of money, not a ton, a ton on this print. Um, but it depends on what you're printing. I know something that's popular is like little miniatures for D&D and other board games, which end up costing a few dollars, which is quite cheap compared to buying miniatures yep. in the store. So, yeah. Well, I, my favorite thing that they printed were parts of 3D printers. I like that idea that you could 3D print parts of 3D mm-hmm. printers and to, stuff to like replace to, the parts to, on because then they would give the parts to somebody else, and then that person would have a 3D printer or well, like 3D printer being whatever it is that they're using. That's like our 3D right. printers. Um, I really like that. And then I really liked the furniture, the production of furniture idea, because I would love the idea of designing your own, like for what exactly whatever you need piece of furniture, especially one of those pieces of furniture that like flips down and comes open and becomes a couch and then it becomes a table. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I would just do those all day Yeah, and then have my couch, table, table, bed, TV, cabinet. I think my favorite 3D printing thing in the book was the 3D printed beverages that they had. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting the that food, you could, yeah. t- could 3D print a drink. I don't, I've been trying to think what kind of drink I would 3D print. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, maybe... Something with all the right uh, nutrients in it to you or give you the like energy. Or like the coffee co- yeah. yeah. Like all the Although right... it didn't sound very good. <laughs> I mean, like people drank it all the time, but then when like they had coffee, they were like... My goodness, coffee. <laughs> but we have coffee all the time. Maybe if we had coffee and we'd be like, oh my God. There must be a reason they drink it all the time. Oh, it was so totally, I'm sure it's good. totally, it, to- it had like drugs in it, right? It's basically <laughs> yeah. what it was. It there was like, they were, they, they had something going on all the time. One of the other questions that we asked in Walk Away was there's a lot of mathematicians, engineers, and computer scientists. Is there room in Dr. O's Utopia for artists and storytellers? Yes. In everyone's utopia, there's room yeah. for artists and storytellers. I think this book was heavily about the people who were kind of on the front lines of the battle. Battle, quotation marks. Well, no, not even quotation marks. The actual battle. Um, the revolution. The revolution. But I think there would be definitely be a lot of storytelling about the people who are designing the clothes, the furniture. Well, just when you're up saying about the, the furniture, these are, yeah. These are artists, right? Absolutely. And they're, the, the onsen and the, the houses and the... Everything. Yeah, everything would need to run on the ideas of artists and then have these other people to collaborate with them and make them real, I would expect. It's kind of like redefining what creativity is. Like, But it's interesting, like in the book, there aren't any characters that you would say are like artists or painters or creators in the in the way that we would not think the, of it today. Not the main characters the, anyway. No, and, and it's kind of interesting how like he makes a point of talking about meritocracy and how that wouldn't work or this is why it shouldn't work because there's that character Jimmy, you know, yeah. and, and that then, you know, he becomes like a cautionary tale later on. But in a way, there like the whole thing kind of works like a meritocracy because if you're not useful, yeah. you, mm-hmm. then you, you're not, you, there's not a place for you, which is always mm-hmm. kind of like a thing like if I was actually living in default or living in walkaway world like uh, what would I do like yeah. I, I'm not 
a, a computer scientist. You know, I'm not an engineer. Uh, you know, I, I guess I could maybe, I don't know, carry stuff around or whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I was getting worried that I, were, I wouldn't have a place there. You know? Yeah. Well, there was a whole thing about the people who didn't work because they, like, didn't believe in work anymore or something like that. They didn't do anything. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you could just do, oh, not do anything. Uh, and I, I think, feel and, about that. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine you doing <laughs> that. You'll find something. But um, then Popo, she, so she would, she, when her discussions on that, she would say, well, everybody can do something. Like maybe it's just going out and, and bringing back the feedstock supplies or whatever. Like that was one of her arguments was that there's always, there's always something that needs to be done. So something that anybody can do. And then if you're not worrying about merit, then you kind of broaden the idea of usefulness and contribution. And maybe it's just maybe you're the person who tells jokes all the time and keeps everybody well, just yeah. gonna say yeah. everybody positive right I'm the, guy, I'm the guy that's so. pr- printing the 3d ll bean uh windbreakers yeah i've designed hey, a new windbreaker for everybody yeah, you're you know, like who, sure why not who collects lists from all the people making <laughs> lists <laughs> Gives everybody catchy nicknames, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, these are uh, That's substantial important. contributions. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we were saying like the artists could be, you know, the, the architects of the cool houses mm-hmm. and the yeah, like cool the furniture idea. and stuff. But I mean, I think there are, there's there needs to also be a place for artists just who are just creating art, just creating beautiful things. In a weird, I don't know. Is yeah. there a place for that in, in his uh, walkaway culture? In yeah, a weird so. meta way. Cory Doctorow is kind of that character in that he wrote the book, which is a work of fiction about right. all these people who are not yeah. storytelling. And, and, and the other thing like, to, to cut the book some slack is that he's describing the beginning of a society where they're in crisis and they're fighting against default. And maybe, like you said, it hasn't actually gotten evolved to the point where they're stable. And then the it's almost like the hierarchy of needs. Like right now, they just have to eat food and not get yeah. killed. Or if they get killed, make sure they've, they're backed up. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but, uh, you well, know... Yeah, Eventually, right. eventually, you know, maybe they'll get to a sort of a, a Stacey's where, you know, yeah, we can, we're, our, our, our basic needs are being met. So now we can write music again. Now we again, can sing about it. Or we can sing about it. We can tell the stories. We can paint. We can create our culture. Like right now, it was a culture of like just... Survival. They're defining themselves as in a negative way. Like they're not default. Yeah. As opposed to saying what they were, which was, yeah. you know, walk away. And then maybe just the, that part of the book wasn't written. That wasn't what he focused on. And then so... Yeah. I would like it to be written. Actually, I really wanted to like this, if it would be like a a two-parter or a trilogy where you know just so that you could have more of what the walk away world looked like before this the other thing about people becoming computers became a thing um and that could have been like the the big thing that they have to overcome after establishing themselves but well and he, and he <sighs> has he has revisited worlds he's written in before so it's very possible he may return to the walk away world so right actually Coffeeum, coffeeum. Is that how you pronounce it? So. That came from another book. I, mm-hmm. I looked it up, and uh, uh, yeah, apparently that came from another book where it uh, more accurately describes what what it is, mm-hmm. and maybe that's where I got the drug thing from. Hmm. They did do drugs. Yes, they did do drugs. Either way, it adds to the utopia. <laughs> <laughs> they just chilled out sometimes. Walking is said to make you healthier more creative, more productive, and more communicative. Being read aloud to as an adult is said to not only be a beautiful art form, but also a valuable way of continually learning and understanding the world around you. So just imagine the enjoyment and benefits of combining both walking and being read aloud to. Find out for yourself and join us at the Harvey Smith West End Library on Saturday, September 22nd from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Inspired by our vibrant and diverse neighborhood, your library guides will stop and read aloud from works by famous writers and poets as we stroll the streets of the West End. Register online or call the Harvey Smith branch at 204-986-4677. So our producer, Dennis, was very smitten with this book. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that he talked about uh, was something that Erica also mentioned in the synopsis, uh, the simulations. And Dennis said that the simulations, of course, throw the concept of self a really big curveball. The simulations only work because they slice away the parts of your life that self-reject the idea of being a simulation. My first reaction is that the sim is no longer the same person 
but then I have to acknowledge that people change through their lives anyways. When someone has a stroke or a brain injury, it also alters elements of a person, though not by choice. Don't we usually consider them to be the same person anyway? We try to change ourselves consciously all the time by adopting new habits, getting rid of bad habits, experience, and the effects of time change our personalities throughout our lives. At what point do these changes make us a different person? Here, here. So, yes, the simulations. And so, for those of you who didn't read the book, the sim. <laughs> Kirsten had this vacant look. <laughs> Just wait till, uh, till you get to that part, Kirsten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the simulations were the idea that you could upload your brain into a computer and then run the upload and have kind of a, a virtual consciousness of yourself uh, running in a computer. Their, their thing was that if the person was killed in one of the yeah, skirmishes, they could bring that, them yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. In a way. Yeah. I think what I liked most about that answer from Dennis was that it reminded me of Buddhism because in Buddhist philosophy, when you're conceiving of an object or a person or yourself, you have to realize that there's no fundamental like empirical reality of it. It's made up out of its parts and it's made out of its relation to how it's used or how it's interacted with. And so for people, they are constantly changing. Their cells are constantly changing. The way they think is constantly changing. They're constantly learning. So there really isn't technically a concept of the self unless it's something that is just like there for a moment and then right. gone. I like it. Yeah. yeah. There's also the idea that the consciousness that you have is also just an illusion and that you yeah. don't actually have your, your self-conscious. The illusion of time and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You can get pretty or, in your head about or it. Or maybe we're living in a simulation already. I, I read a thing that said there's. it's more likely that we're living in a simulation than not. Yeah. Don't what? we or talk something about like that, that in this book? Oh, was it in oh, this book? Yeah. yeah no. I'm sure it was somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, doctor, they, doctor. <laughs> it could have been because once once you get to the point where no, you no, it was can... on CBC Radio. It's... Oh, well, then <laughs> it was somebody who was talking about the world that we live in is like perfect for have, being the product of a simulation rather than a because ma mathematically we're like always trying to simulate the world, and once we get to a point where we can more perfectly simulate the world, then that simulation can get to a point where it's. Yeah. creating more simulation like oh, like like my it, mind is like it, just blowing it, it, i know that's what hurt my brain about it's yeah. like the finale of saint elsewhere remember how it, <laughs> when it pans down and, and the entire world of saint elsewhere is just in a snow globe yeah. and it's in the mind of that uh child yeah. that has autism yeah. and, and and then there's actually uh oh, i wish i remember the name of the, the kid something tommy westfall if you if you if you look up google tommy westfall there's a tommy westfall universe because people have actually gone around and figured out all the shows that tie into saint elsewhere yeah. and how they're all part of this uh, world too like for example <laughs> oh, oh uh, there was oh, I can't remember I think it takes place in Boston so there was a Cheers crossover so all of the uh, characters on Cheers are now part of this episode and so that means Fraser is because Fraser is a right. spinoff of Cheers yeah. and then there's a episode of Cheers where they go on Jeopardy so then like, the Jeopardy, <laughs> Jeopardy world so, so the, it's, it's really quite crazy to uh, yeah so maybe maybe we're all wow. just living in Tommy Westfall's six uh, degrees uh, adult of brain Kevin Could Bacon be, yeah <laughs> Kevin Bacon would be there too of course <laughs> So I have to know if everyone would upload themselves. Would you upload a copy of yourself? Maybe when I'm 97. You wouldn't want a backup just to remain in stasis? Uh, no, 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 no. I'll take Probably that as a... Probably not. That's <laughs> no. pretty creepy. You'd, I'd kind of just hope that when I came, I'd have enough time to make a scan. Well, it's a little morbid, but it's like, you know, when you turn to the, the obituaries page and there's mm -hmm. people's pictures mm -hmm. and it's like, well, what picture do you choose? Do you choose a picture of how they looked when they were elderly yeah. or do you choose like a young picture when they're like, like smoking the, and you, laughing? You know, like what do you do? Yeah. Well, how do you want to be remembered? So Absolutely. I was just thinking of that when I was walking in here and I saw the bust of Carol Shields on the way yeah. to the Carol oh, Shields auditorium yeah. and I was like, if I had a bust, what I want it to be... <laughs> <laughs> if I www.alansbus.com <laughs> Yes, we could we could 3D print we could, we could totally 3D, 3D print, print a bust of you. You just have to pick it up now. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, That's I, number twenty one on the list of things you can never have to buy if you have a 3D printer. I think we should do it. <laughs>
Kirsten, would you upload yourself? I still don't know if I re- really even so I'll upload like a backup in case yeah, something well, they happens. Yeah, they called me. it a backup. Yeah, so that if yeah, so that if the person I just died, feel like, no, like so you don't want to mess with that. You'd have a gap in time between when you did the upload and when they booted up. Booted it up. Mm-hmm. So that time between you uploaded and you died would be a blank, and you right. just wake up being uploaded. Right. And the parameters would be set no, so I that would you would be that. fine with it yeah. as a computer. You which, would be fine with being that a computer. Part was really, that part that was, was kind of creepy. I loved that part. The, 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 uh, the, there are parameters. I to wish people keep could you. do that for me now, where it'd be like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> change the parameters of my life so I could just be like, this is fine. <laughs> this is who I am. This is how it's going on. That'd be fine. <laughs> and, and I guess that's, I, I didn't fully understand when they're talking about the look aheads. You know, when, was, it, yeah. was that sort of like the idea that you, the, that, was, that was one of the parameters they would put on a uploaded um, a consciousness that they couldn't see the future? Is that, or, or, or remember they come to, or yeah, look arounds or look, I thought that, was, that look was, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was like running a test program with certain parameters to see how far ahead it, it could would go be stable? to see oh, if it would okay, be stable. Yeah. Yeah. Was, like in the early days mine. with discs and stuff, trying to f- make her, you know, yes. yeah. stable. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But I don't, yeah, I don't know. That right. part was. Well, that was, the, that was the other thing. Like he didn't really, uh, Cory Doctora, I mean, it, it didn't take a lot of time to explain concepts, which I kind of liked. Like he kind of threw these terms out and you, by, by context, you could sometimes figure out what he was talking about. And sometimes I had no idea, but he didn't sort of like spoon feed you these yeah, ideas. I like, I like that yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Because like, oh. then you're not reading like definitions of things. Right. All right. The time. I mean, I would, maybe I would, would appreciate a little glossary in the back of what the, all these things were, but it, yeah. it was okay. Like I didn't, it was, you know, like I, yeah. I, I didn't, it didn't, uh, you know, you know, take away from my enjoyment. Mm. So it's now time to segue (laughs) into our most awkwardly worded segment. (laughs) Can you tell me a book you would also like? So can you? We're already at that. Tell me a book you would also... I know, it's gone gone by fast. I'll just go first because uh, why not? Because I started talking first. (laughs) And one is based on the ideas of self that they talk about and that I thought kind of was similar to to Buddhist philosophy. And it's called Zen in the Age of Anxiety. And it's it's an introduction to Buddhist thinking written by Tim Burkett. And he's it's neat because he's grew up in California and he likes to relate everything to pop culture. So he, he talks a lot about the movies in our head that are playing about the things that are that are happening and how we have to pay attention to those movies because sometimes they're not true. And sometimes the rules that we're taking on don't actually have to be taken on. So that was a good one. And then the other book that this reminded me of, I guess, because it's the other utopian fiction that I've read lately was Arcadia by Lauren, Gr- Lauren Gr- Groff. Groff. Um, and I, I'm not sure why I kept thinking of that. Maybe just comparing the, the debates that were going on about how to live um, between these two books. So you could try either one of those. I was just thinking about that book as well when Alan was talking about living with people. And I was thinking back to that book yeah. because mm-hmm. they definitely describe in, in a lot of detail of how that how all works work. and how it looks and how it I doesn't work. There and, was like, a, I think there are a lot of similarities between that, you know, 70s commune mm-hmm. kind of ideal and the idea of, of walk away, as Cory Doctorow puts it. Like, I don't think the idea of walking away from society is, is a new no. idea. No, like, yeah, no. Cult, like no. the, the counterculture yeah. movement of the 60s yeah. or, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is just sort of the version of that utopian idea in the next hundred years. Yeah. And what it, what it could look like. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, my book, uh, I was always thinking about, you know, is uh, Walk Away a Dystopia, is a Utopia. So I picked a classic dystopian slash utopian novel called The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula Le Guin. Mm-hmm. And the idea with this book is that a, it takes place in the near future. Well, actually, when it was written, it was the near future. It's 2002, but, <laughs> but it was written in 1971. So you can see it was in the future. And this person, George Orr, the main character, when he sleeps, and we've talked about this a bit before, he can, uh, what's that called when you uh, can like control your dreams? Uh, waking dream? Yeah. Lucid. But, but lucid, lucid yeah. dreaming. So he lucid dreams to the extreme where when he wakes up, whatever he's dreamed has actually come to pass. Mm-hmm. So he can change the world. 
uh, every night when he dreams, it comes a new world. And so this, uh, he wants to see a psychiatrist because he's afraid to go to sleep because uh, uh, how the world's going to change. So the psychiatrist is trying to then create alternate worlds. So for example, uh, the psychiatrist tells George to dream a world where there's no racism. So when he wakes up, everyone has this weird light gray color. There's no races. <laughs> and then when he tries to like solve overpopulation, he wakes up, there's a huge plague that kills a huge chunk of the population. So in, in trying to create utopias, they're actually creating more problems. And, and then the last problem was uh, trying to dream peace on Earth. But they were, the, the result is that an alien invasion of the moon happens. <laughs> so, so the whole uh, nations of the world band together Come to fight this common oh, enemy. And that's so, amazing. So it, it, yeah, and that's not even the whole story. Those are just some of the things. So I would <laughs> recommend that. The Lay of, of Heaven by Ursula mm. Le Guin. It's a great read. Sounds good. So this book reminded me of another book, a book that I recommend, didn't <laughs> recommend that I talked about in one of my English classes in university when the professor asked the class, it was first class and it was an icebreaker. And it was, what book have you read that's changed your view of the world the most? Wow. And so it was at University of Winnipeg, which is a very liberal university amongst universities. And I said, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear a pin drop <laughs> in that... <laughs> in that classroom and they looked at me and they're like well what do you mean and well I thought about the question is like what changed your outlook on life and so that book is is very similar to walk away in that it's uh but from kind of the opposite political spectrum mm -hmm. of people who would consider themselves uh right wing walking away from society and what happens to society when they leave and the type of society that they bring together that the, their kind of utopia that they put together. And so the reason it changed my outlook on life is because I don't think like that naturally. And so it just kind of like opened my door to a whole different, the thoughts and ideas of how, uh, you know, a segment of society that doesn't affect the way that doesn't live the way that I live or think the way I think, um, how they think and their rationale. And I thought it did a very good job job at that. Uh, I don't think that Ayn Rand's philosophy for society as outlined in Atlas Shrugged is a society that I would like to live in, but it's it's a book that really opened my eyes to wanting to read things that challenge me. Mm -hmm. There's always the idea of reading banned books, um, which I like to take a step further, and I'm always on the lookout for books that challenge my way of thinking or that come from opposing mm -hmm. yeah. viewpoints of, of thought. So Atlas Shrugged, it's a page turner. <laughs> <laughs> what I read instead. <laughs> uh, the Dictionary of Animal Languages by Heidi Sopinka. It was completely different <laughs> from Walk Away about a uh, reclusive painter in her 90s who's um, sort of obsessed with her, the creative work that she's doing, which is in part science, part art, where she's creating this dictionary that where she's trying to transcribe uh, the wordless communication and yearning of animals, Ooh. which also isn't really sort of the type of genre that I would read, like, aside from the art, the artist and reclusive part of it. But because um, I'm not I'm not a big animal reader, but it's mainly about her and her relationships. And it's set in Paris partly. And it's about artists and love and how life can change in an instant, even in your 90s. Um, she gets word about a granddaughter uh, that she didn't know that she had, even though she had no family. Um, and it was, I guess, also just really beautifully written, very unusually written. And it also really spoke to the idea of women and mental health, especially in that era, and how women and mental health used to be perceived and maybe still do, like especially around sort of hysteria and especially with creative women who didn't have husbands or children at home and sort of these like not normal social conditions. Anyway, it was a very enjoyable read on my holiday this past month. That sounds good. That is the, the Dictionary of Animal Languages by Heidi Sopinka, who is a Canadian author. Oh, yeah. I really loved that this was Canadian mm -hmm. content. Yes. That was yeah. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, and all the, like, the, the Toronto place <laughs> yeah. names. Like they, yeah. they, in the beginning, they go to Franz, which is one of my favorite restaurants in Toronto, <laughs> but they're all like robot servers. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have you ever wanted to record yourself singing or playing an instrument? Want to make a podcast or record an oral history? My name's Dennis, and I produce the audio for the Time to Read podcast. 
I'll be presenting a program about home recording called Recording Audio with Audacity in September and October this year. We'll be focusing on recording at home with a computer and a free program called Audacity. We'll discuss the basics of recording and editing for beginners, talk about different types of microphones and how to set up your recording space for best results. It's a hands-on program, so you'll be recording and editing audio too. The program will be held in the Idea Mill, the new makerspace at the Millennium Library. To check program times or to register, go to winnipeg.ca slash library and click on the Programs and Events button in the middle of the page. Or you can call us at the Idea Mill at 204-986-5543. We look forward to seeing you there. And let's move on to our favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, the part of each show where our hosts boil down their most prevalent thoughts of the past month into one word. Ooh, I like it. That's yeah, good. that yeah, is good. good definition or, or, of or in my case this month, two or three words. <laughs> <laughs> it's a phrase. It's a nerd phrase. Oh, right? yes. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like nerd yeah. phrases. Yeah. yeah. What's mm-hmm. your nerd phrase, Trevor? Well, I'll start off then, I guess. Uh, my nerd phrase is hand of glory. Now, it is the dried and pickled hand of a man who has been hanged, uh, and uh, it has magical properties. Uh, if you stick a candle in it and light it and hold it, it will uh, make whoever uh, sees it motionless. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, hear, hear me out. Hear me out. In, in the 1722 textbook of magic, this is how you make a hand of glory. Oh. Take the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet beside a highway. Wrap it in part of a funeral pall and so wrapped, squeeze it well. Then put it into an earthenware vessel with zimmet, nitre, salt, and long peppers. The whole well powdered. Leave it in this vessel for a fortnight. Then take it out and expose it to full sunlight during the dog days until it becomes quite dry. If the sun is not strong enough to put it in an oven with fern and vervain. Next, make a kind of a candle from the fat of a gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame, and pony. And use the hand of glory as a candlestick to hold this candle when lighted. And then those in every place into which you go with this baneful instrument shall remain motionless. Hmm. And the reason I was thinking about yes. category <laughs> is, uh, is, is, is last month I talked about uh, going through a cemetery with uh, fireflies and uh, mm-hmm. visiting the hometown John Valeres. Well, in John Valeres' book, The House with a Clock in Its Walls, uh, a hand of glory features prominently in it as a, as a thing that the, uh, the evil wizard uses. And uh, this month, well, actually not this month, but in September, it, well, I guess it is this month by the time this podcast comes out, uh, the, the House with a Clock in, in, in Its Walls has been made into a movie starring Jack Black and Kate Kate Blanchett, and it comes out on September 21st, and I'm super stoked. <laughs> and September 21st is also happens to be Stephen King's birthday, so I think that bodes well for this movie. And uh, hand glory, everybody. Right wow. on. Wow. Excellent. That's quite a recipe. <laughs> <laughs> top that. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. Well, I, I'll no. go next. Uh, sure. I won't top it, but okay. So I was just on holidays. It yeah, seems like you're saying. always on I holidays. I know, <laughs> it <laughs> does. It's just my life. Just walking away. So, <laughs> just walking away. Okay, so I was just in France with um, a bunch of friends. No big deal. <laughs> Pas grand shows. Um, yeah. And uh, so our word that was tickling our tongues the whole time we were there was bisou. Oh. Bisou and bees. So meaning kiss. Bisou being the more playful, more familiar version of bees. There are bees rules, of course. One, two, three, or four kisses on the cheeks, depending on where you are kissing. Like, mm. whether it be Paris, Bordeaux. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I knew that's what you were thinking, Trevor. <laughs> uh, there is a bees map that you can consult to help you avoid those um, embarrassing faux pas of beezing on the wrong <laughs> cheeks or the wrong number of Come on times. Um, so you can use the word uh, bizu as a sign off to emails. So you will start seeing some, uh, um, uh. some emails from me, Kirsten Werman, uh, Branchhead at uh, Harvey Smith. Bizu, bizu. BX instead of XOXO. Okay. BX. Mm-hmm. So and then the soundtrack to our trip as well, because everyone needs a soundtrack to their vacation, was Jillian Harris's 1960 song, Zoo Be Zoo Be Zoo, which is an open declaration of love and the joy of kissing about how <laughs> kissing is so much fun. So Be cute. Zoo. And there's a great uh, rendition of that song if you've ever watched Mad Men. Mad Men, oh, yes. Right. yes. Yes, that's true. 
All right. Mine is a nerd term, which I don't normally do. It's a nerd term. It's pathetic fallacy. Ooh. And it's a term that um, I learned in high school English class. But it turns out the, the definition of it is a little bit different than what I, um, what I was uh, always applying it to. So it's a pathetic fallacy, according to the Britannica online, is the poetic practice of attributing human emotion or responses to nature, inanimate objects or animals. The practice is a form of personification that is as old as poetry, in which it has always been common to find dancing flowers, brooding mountains, moping owls, or happy larks. And I had internalized it, I guess, as in literature or something where there's storm clouds gathering as the tension builds between characters or a storm is raging while the fight is going right. on. So that's how I always heard it. But I always love that term of pathetic fallacy. Hmm. I love it, too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Have you ever read Fables by Bill Willingham? No. A uh, great graphic novel series all about uh, fables like Little Red Riding Hood and um, Snow White coming, uh, being exiled from where they're from and having to live in New York. Mm-hmm. And in that universe, there is a, a literal personification of, of the pathetic, path- fallacy. Of path- pathetic fallacy as a character. And nice. it, it's fantastic. That sounds great. My nerd word is remix. And... I was thinking about Remix a lot this uh, month because I was reading Cory Doctorow. Cory Doctorow is very big on copyright and releasing his books with, what's the term? Open copyright? Creative stuff. Commons. Creative Commons, that's the term. Uh, and allowing people to copy and allowing people to copy allows you to remix something without any legal hassles. Um, so that's one of the things, one, one of the types of creativity that gets stifled by copyright law is that if you are a musical artist and you want to remix something and, or you want use samples from another song you have to get all sorts of legal clearance and it can get very costly to do that how it ties to cory doctorow is when i was in school we there's a student produced journal called the ya hotline uh, in which a group of students comes together and produces a librarian journal about a certain topic my group did uh, remix culture. And one of the things I did was an interview with Cory Doctorow uh, himself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was I was like, oh, he seems pretty, you know, outgoing on social media. So I, I emailed him and asked him if he would do an interview. And uh, he said, yes, uh, it was an email interview. So I didn't get on the phone with him. Uh, then I went uh, and told uh, my professor that this is what I was doing. And they were like, you need to get uh, ethics clearance to oh, do that. Right. And uh, I was like, well, too late. I already yeah. did that. And it's Cory Doctorow. <laughs> it's Cor- well, the thing is, is it's an interview. It's not like I'm doing a psychological Research. study. So yeah. anyways, I fought that in the meantime, in the background, did the did the interview anyway. And it turns out I didn't need ethics in the end. And the interview was published. Uh, so I just wanted to read a brief excerpt mm. from, uh, from it. Cory Doctorow talking about kids and copying. Uh, and we can link to the full article online if you're interested. It's a really great interview. So this is Cory Doctorow talking about kids and copying. Kids have always done this. This is how every kid does everything. Copying and adapting is the soul of learning. When my daughter was born, my mom came from Toronto for a visit and she said, have you stuck your tongue out yet? I said, no, mom, I haven't stuck my tongue out at my week old baby yet. My mom has a PhD in early childhood education. She knows a lot about kids. And she said, you should here watch. She picked up my week old daughter up in her arms and she looked down at her face and stuck her tongue out and my daughter stuck her tongue back out at her grandmother my daughter was too young to know she had a tongue she'd never felt her tongue she'd never seen her tongue in the mirror but she knew how to copy the way she knew how to nuzzle for the breast no one has to teach how to copy copying is how we do language acquisition copying is how we do skill acquisition originality is just filing off the serial numbers amateurs plagiarize artists steal Oh, mm. so nice, nice, nice. Artists steal. It's like that line from the U2 song Every artist is a cannibal, every poet is a thief. There you go. Yes. I always reminds me of the, um, the Hope, the Obama Hope poster, and how I believe that was that somebody had taken the picture and then somebody else had taken it and arranged it into the four things with the, with the multicolored Hope thing. And then mm-hmm. there was a huge controversy over that having had happened. And I was just like, just let them use the picture. <laughs> but of course, somebody puts work into the photography side. So, yeah. yeah. 
In the United States, I believe if you're a political figure, you give up a lot of your rights to images of your face. Yeah. Interestingly. I know well. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to sign off for this Aww. month. Thank you so much, dear readers, for tuning into this octanary episode of the Time to Read podcast. Next month, we will be reading The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Woo-hoo. Erica's favorite book. Is it still your favorite book? Yes. So everybody I, has to be nice. <laughs> I will read it. I promise. You know, you can read it next it, it year. Makes me get really back exci- to me. It makes me. It makes me really excited. I love reading other people's favorite books. You it's, cannot like it. That's okay. <laughs> I'll I'll just cry when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the long way to a small angry planet. Uh, find it at your local Winnipeg Public Library branch. Be sure to join our discussion on our website wpl podcastwinnipegca or by emailing us at wpl podcast at winnipegca If you find us on iTunes, we'd love it if you were to give us the coveted five star rating. And until next time, make sure you find time, time to read. read. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Time to Read. We were discussing Walk Away by Cory Doctorow. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Your hosts today were Alan Chorney, Kirsten Werman, Erica Ball, and Trevor Lockhart. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. Some of our comments today came from Amy and me. We want you to be part of the show, too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss, and comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today, and take part in a discussion about the books we're reading. Next month, we're reading Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. We're looking forward to hearing what you think. Start again.